So Hito Meyer is going to give a talk about standardized and reproducible measurement of decision making in mice. So Yuan, thanks. Can you um, unshare your screen? Oh, sorry. Yes. No, no, you're good. All right. Can you see my screen? Yeah, it looks good. Okay. Uh, well, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Hido, uh, Hido Meyer, and I uh, am a postdoc in the International Brain Lab. Um, and today I'll be telling you about our standardized behavioral paradigm that we've uh, now successfully reproduced in seven different laboratories across the world. Um, so our aim, our ultimate goal is to understand brain-wide circuits during a single complex behavior. And the behavior should have um, all these aspects that you see listed down here. And we believe that this aim is something that is uh, too large to actually accomplish by a single traditional lab approach. And therefore, uh, the International Brain Lab was founded, which is a collaboration between 22 labs uh, that span experimental to theoretical backgrounds. And our approach in getting to this goal is to uh, go for high throughput experimentation. We use a common data architecture. Uh, we develop open source hardware and software which ultimately lead to the publication of publicly available data sets. And most importantly, we aim to standardize as much as we can across the laboratories in our collaboration. And our standardization comes in a couple of different levels. So we have things that are fully standardized. So for example, the hardware, the rig itself, and the software that's used to uh, run the task, the mouse train, obviously, and our handling, training, and surgery protocols. And then we have things that uh, should either fall within a range or uh, is a choice between two options. So within a range is, for example, the, the protein and fat concentration in the food that the mice get, their weight and age. Uh, and also, in some cases, the uh, experimenter or lab can choose to go for two things. In the light cycle, for example, they can opt to go for an inverted or non-inverted light cycle. Uh, we have two mouse providers, one in Europe and one in the US, uh, where they can choose from because we cannot really ship mice across the Atlantic and actually have a single mouse provider. Um, and we use male and females. Then there are things that we cannot standardize, but we can only measure. So for example, the temperature, the humidity, and the ambient noise in the vivarium of each uh, institution. So the task that we uh, settled on using is um, developed originally in the Cortex lab at UCL. Um, very quickly, the mouse has a steering wheel in front of it and it's looking at a screen. A stimulus appears either on the left or the right. Um, and by turning the, the wheel, the mouse has to put this stimulus in the center of the screen to get a sugar water reward. When the mouse moves the wheel the wrong way, the stimulus moves outside of the screen and the mouse gets a white noise burst and a time out. Um, this is the rig that we developed to do this. Um, it's completely open source. And if you want to build one yourself, just go to this website you see here, which has a list of all the components we use uh, and build instruction guides that guide you through the whole process of, uh, of building one, if you do feel so inclined. We have a uh, automatic progression through training phases to minimize experimenter interf uh, interference, basically. Um, here you can see the training days on the x-axis and uh, contrast on the y-axis. Um, and the negative contrasts are on the left and positive contrasts are on the right. So you can see that in the first phase of training, the mice only get uh, two high contrast options. And as they progress, the algorithm decides when to introduce lower contrasts up until, in this case, day 14, where the animal uh, has the full contrast set. As you can see um, in the color, it makes the correct choices if the stimuli is either on the left or on the right. So the mice in our task, they learn quickly, um, but the training times are variable overlaps. So here you see data of 140 mice that we've trained in this task, and um, in uh, they have an overall median of 14.5 uh, days until they reach trained criterion. Um, but as you can see, there is still uh, some labs that have uh, shorter training time 
compared to others, and there is indeed a significant effect here. Um, and preparing for this talk, it occurred to me that one of the things that actually differs between labs is whether they use an inverted or a non-inverted light cycle. Uh, and I actually um, found some indication that contrary to what I expected, it seems to be that uh, mice that are trained in labs that use a non-inverted light cycle learn faster. So that is when the mouse is actually trained in their inactive phase, which I would have expected the opposite. But um, this is uh, still to be confirmed, but uh, it's at least an interesting indication. Um, when they reach the trained criterion when they, um, that we have set for the mice, they show very stable psychophysic uh, performance. So here you can see the psychometric curves and every color is a different lab. Um, of all the my, mice that reached the trained criterion. Uh, and you can see that they overlap uh, nicely, indicating a reproducible stable psychophysics. From these ex, uh, psychometric curves, we can extract a couple of, um, a couple of metrics, um, like the performance on easy trials, uh, their contrast threshold, and their bias. And uh, none of these metrics uh, significantly varied overlaps, indicating that um, indeed their behavior is reproducible. Then after uh, they reach this phase of training uh, and they do it well, they go into the next phase of training. And in this phase, we introduce uh, a manipulation on the stimulus prior probability. So in blocks, we change the probability that the stimulus will appear on either the left or the right side of the screen. And uh, every session starts with 90 trials where the stimulus prior probability is still 50-50. So the same as the rest of uh, the training phases. But then in blocks, the prior probability is changed to either being uh, more probable to appear on the left, as is indicated here by 80-20, or on the right, as is indicated by 20-80. So it's an 80% probability of the stimulus appearing on either one of those two sides. And uh, as expected, uh, we find that mice bias their behavior according to uh, the statistics in the stim stimulus prior probability. Um, so you can see in red here that for the blocks where the stimulus prior probability was higher on the right, um, the psychometric curve is shifted to the left and vice versa. We can quantify this as uh, the delta rightward choices. So how much, um, how much more likely are they to choose right um, in the left block in blue compared to the right block here in uh, left. And when you do that, you see that the bias is highest when the stimulus contrast is low, um, which makes sense. We also have this condition of 0% contrast. And in that case, um, there is actually no stimulus. There is a go queue though, so the mouse doesn't know that they have to make a response. Um, and in that case, they are strongly biased towards the side uh, where the prior probability is highest. And importantly, there is no consistent difference uh, overlaps when you look at this metric. Here, we've pulled out a couple of, um, of these metrics. So the um, contrast threshold, for example, which is basically the steepness of the psychometric curve um, it doesn't really change in the two blocks and also is not significantly different uh, across labs. Then we have the lapses. And so the, uh, they do tend to show uh, a bias that in one of the two blocks, they have fewer lapses to uh, when the prior probability is high on the left, they have fewer lapses on the left and vice versa here. Uh, and they have, of course, a very strong bias uh, in the block that is currently presented. Um, but again, importantly, none of these metrics uh, significantly varied overlaps, uh, showing that also this bias protocol uh, is reproducible across laboratories. Then a small teaser is that um, using this task, we now went into the second phase where we actually aim to record the entire mouse brain with neuropixels. Well, the left hemisphere, like the most important hemisphere of the mouse brain, the left one, of course, with uh, neuropixel recordings. Every red line here is a planned neuropixel insertion site. And this is uh, very exciting and it's currently on the way. So you will uh, hear more about that hopefully soon. 
Uh, then I'd want to thank the entire collaboration and our funders. Uh, I've highlighted here in bold uh, the people that uh, can provided a key contribution to the work I've showed today. And if you want to know more, check out our, our website, uh, internationalbrainlab.com. Uh, and I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'll take any questions. Thanks, Hito, great talk. Uh, does anyone have any questions? I, I have a, a quick one, um, which is, is this the statistics for the mice that successfully on the task? And is there a variability across labs on how many mice actually learn the task? So yeah, um, the psychophysics I showed is indeed for the mice that success successfully learned the task. So I'd have to think about if there is a significant difference in the percentage of mice that actually do learn. I brought along this figure here, I think. Where is it? Ah, uh, no, I don't have it with me. Um, there's, there's some slight differences, but um, we didn't explicitly test if they're significantly different across laboratories. Well, I'll have to check. I, I mean, it's not super important. The, the ultimate question is, can you tell if a mouse is going to be able to kind of learn the task? And do you have all of this data now where maybe you have a better handle on what mice learn and what mice don't learn, for instance, and that sort of thing? Yeah, so Inej might uh, want to chime in on this because this is actually a project that she's working on. So she's actually trying to predict whether a mouse is going to be a fast or a slow learner based on oh. their behavior in the first session. So this is uh, something indeed yeah. very interesting and it does seem to work a bit. Maybe Inej wants to say something. Uh, so what I can say is that fortunately we're able to collect lots of data like Hido is exemplified a bit. We have all kinds of metadata available and very easily uh, queryable uh, information about mice, uh, conditions in the rig uh, and their behavior. And we can pull all of this data and actually um, a random forest classifier can predict quite uh, or above chance level for sure, uh, how long a mouse will take to learn. Uh, it turns out that it will relies a lot on on uh, the performance and number of number of trials that uh, mice do very early on, um, but definitely uh, this the size of this data will be um, promising for this kind of analysis. Interesting. Thanks. So this gets back kind of to your talk too that maybe you do want to maximize the number of trials that they can do. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, this has to do with the fact that we do acute recordings, right? And we want to maximize each session uh, and we want to test different contrasts, different conditions within one session for one penetration. And that's why it's not only in, in the case of, of this uh, project, but in many projects, the trial counts matters. Um, but what I was saying before was more throughout learning we see that this is a, a feature of mice that learn faster they're also doing more trials because in our task we we don't fix the length of the the session or the number of trials and so we allow mice to do as much as they want more or less i mean we have criterion for for this and so this is one feature um, in early learning that the ones that do more trials uh, are learning faster. Cool, thanks. Yeah, sorry, I guess I, I meant like the fact that you you might want to use the vanilla water restriction to make sure that they have enough trials at the beginning. Like what you were talking about seems to be maximizing this learning as well. Uh, what do you mean the vanilla? Okay. Well, just, sorry, not, but I shouldn't use the word vanilla. Uh, I meant mm -hmm. nor, normal water restriction rather than the CA water restriction to make sure that they're doing a lot of trials at the beginning. Um, ah, um, so it's complementary. What we found is that, so this, the thing is on, on weekends we don't train them and they still should be within the same level of water deprivation or, or we should maintain their motivation to do the trials. And what we found is that the citric acid does not uh, harm the performance throughout the week. Um, 
we also didn't find that it's any better or worse than normal water restriction. It's just that it presents some advantages uh, in, in the way it can be applied. Cool. So importantly, the, the citric acid water didn't change their learning curve. Yes. So it's not that they exactly. learned slower uh, on citric acid. Right, but that was only citric acid on the weekend, not all the time. Right. Exactly. Uh, also because we own, for this big uh, data set, we only tested uh, differences in water regime regarding the weekend. Every, everything else that I showed uh, that was eventually throughout the whole week, uh, that was with different mice. Um, yeah, kind of a preliminary experience. Uh, 